Hello, I'm Dave Reddish. I'm a professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Minnesota. And I'm pleased and honored to have been asked to tell this story as part of the storytelling session for the 50th Annual Society for Neuroscience meeting. I think we can call this story Catch-22. So this would have been about 2005 or so. I was an assistant professor. I was coming up for tenure in 2006. And to put it bluntly, I was worried. I had been told in no uncertain terms that the promotion and tenure committee would look at my current funding and I didn't have current federal funding. I didn't have an active R01. I'd made some tactical mistakes as a junior professor. I mean, we all do, it shouldn't have been career ending. I mean, it's part of the learning process of being a, a new professor. We're gonna make mistakes and you hope that you can recover from them. I had bought equipment that I was sure I needed and of course never used. Um, and I'd been having a lot of trouble getting my work funded. I was trying to learn how to write grants. I was asking for help. I was, you know, but I was having a lot of trouble getting my work funded. I had actually had a small NIH R01 federal grant, but I had foolishly and incorrectly um, asked for what I thought was an assistant professor's budget from a, it was a, from a NSF panel. Now it was actually a joint NSF NIH thing. It got picked up by NIH, but it went through NSF. And I, I had, again, incorrectly thought that that limited the budget that we could put forward. Um, and so it ended up being a three-year grant rather than a five-year grant. And that meant the grant ran out before I reached tenure. So I'm approaching tenure and I don't have an active federal grant. But we'd made a beautiful discovery in the lab. We had found that rats were imagining the future. And I always like to tell this story because it's about being open to serendipity. And I think that's underestimated in a lot of science that a lot of times when we talk about failure in science, what we're really talking about is learning to be open to serendipity. So this story starts when my graduate student, Adam Johnson, came into my office one day and said, Dave, my rats are doing mental time travel. To say I was skeptical would be polite. I said, no way. I said, rats don't do that. I think I said, we don't use words like that in public. But you know, I, I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. And actually, I love being wrong because that's when discoveries are made. So I said, show me what you've got. And uh, what Adam had actually observed is that he had been recording from a brain structure called the hippocampus, which represents where the rat is in space. And from a population of hippocampal cells, you can decode not only where the rat is, but kind of what the hippocampus is representing. And what Adam had found is that as an animal approached this choice point where it was going to go left for food or right for food, that the hippocampal representation was sweeping ahead of the rat, left, then right, back and forth, alternating. The rat was literally deliberating between its two choices. The rats were imagining the future. I think it's really important to point out Adam did not set out to study rats imagining the future. In fact, we had been doing a dorsolateral striatum project in the lab. That was kind of where we had started. And we had not been able to get that dorsolateral project funded, but we'd had a, another hippocampal project funded. But we'd set out to study this dorsolateral striatum question. What is the dorsolateral striatum doing in navigation? And my first graduate student, Neil Schmitzer-Torbert, had designed a task 
to develop that in which rats automated their behavior. They developed an automated behavior over time. And we had observed what dorsolateral striatum does in automation. We'd made a couple of discoveries. We'd published a couple of papers in Journal of Neurophysiology and in uh, neuroscience and journals like that. And um, I was writing, I started to get asked to give talks and I was writing one of these first talks and I was gonna write and say, okay, dorsolateral striatum on this navigation task does this. And in comparison, the other navigation structure that we all talk about, the hippocampus, And I realized for all the work everybody had done in hippocampus, nobody had actually looked at hippocampal representation on a basic maze task. When a rat comes to a choice point, comes to a T and turns left or right, right? And this is rats on mazes, nobody had done that. And so I convinced Adam to go do that. I convinced him that that was a, a good project to do. And he, for all the grad students out there, right? He spent years complaining, there's nothing here. These are place cells. We know what place cells look like. This is just place cells on this task. There's just, I'm wasting my time. There's nothing, nothing interesting. And then one day he comes into my office and says, Dave, my rats are thinking about the future. So I'm an assistant professor. I'm coming up for tenure and my grants have all run out. I mean, at this point, my lab is living on fumes. What I'd actually done, the way we were surviving and surviving barely was that I was, we were living as a beta tester for engineering colleagues. So I, I convinced my engineering colleagues who would go out and get these big grants that, um, well, they would need some way to test their new fancy, cool recording system. And I could do that for them. And we could compare it to the state of the art stuff that we did with Tetrodes. And what they would need is need to put in a little budget line to say, you know, fund my tech and fund part of my grad student. And when you're ready, bring it over and we will um, compare your fancy new technology to the Tetrode technology. And um, we'll need to record somewhere. So why not say, I don't know, Hippocampus and dorsolateral striatum? Seems reasonable. So we'd made this cool discovery. We sent it to science. It went out for review and it came back asking for a whole bunch of controls. The reviewers had all these questions. What about this? What about that? Have you checked this? Have you checked that? The problem is they weren't wrong, right? These were things that we didn't have control, right? This wasn't a task designed to test this question. We hadn't set out to study rats imagining the future. We had set out to study automation. We'd set out to study the, how the dorsolateral striatum changes. And we'd run this extra experiment and made a discovery. Okay, you know what? That's what grants are for, right? We've made a discovery. We have all these questions. These are important questions. This is a clear gap in the literature. We should go be able to go get a grant to study this question. We'll design the task carefully. We'll get all the right controls, right? We now know we've generated the hypothesis. Now we can test the hypothesis, right? Study section should like that. That's what grants are all about. So we wrote up the R01, we wrote up a grant, submitted it. And study section basically came back saying, publish the paper and we'll give you the grant. Now I don't, I don't they didn't literally say that, um, but it was very clear that that's what they meant. And all my senior colleagues, when I went and we talked about, you know, what do these reviews mean? They were saying, publish the paper and they'll give you the grant. Or in the, in the in the in the words of the storytelling title, right? Oh, what do we do now? <laughs> we need the paper to get the grant, but we need the grant to do all the controls, right? My lab's running on fumes. We're out of money. I'm coming up for tenure. We don't have the money to do the new experiment. We don't have the time. What do we do? 
right? That's the whole point. We needed the grant to do this, to do this, right? Kind of, I felt really trapped. But then I, I sat down with Adam and we started peeling the data apart. We started saying, okay, we didn't design the task for this question, but is there anything in the task that can tell us things that might inform this question? When the rat comes to the choice point and turns the corner to get food, as it turns the second corner, kind of here's the choice point, comes over, it turns the corner and the food would be kind of down here. As it turns the corner, a solenoid would release a food pellet that would then come down where the rat could go get food, that solenoid made a click sound. The rat makes an error, it doesn't hear the click sound and it would often stop as if it was making another choice. Maybe it didn't hear the click, wasn't paying attention or something. And so there's, should just keep going and there'll be food there. Or maybe it made a mistake and the food's actually on the other side and it should go running across to get food. Now the rats weren't supposed to be able to run backwards. At the time, what we had to prevent the rat from running backwards was Adam and a big stick. And the idea was that if the rat turned around and tried to run backwards, Adam would grab the stick and try to block the rat. Now I would point out, right, this, Result has been replicated many times. We now have one-way doors. We have better training. The stick isn't part of the, the result. But the rat, actually, again, it has a choice. Does it keep going to the, to the food or does it run backwards and try to beat Adam getting to it with the stick? And we saw the same sequences. We saw sequences running from where the rat was down to the feeder and backwards over the rail back to where, past the choice point to the other side. So at the choice point, it's going left or right. At this error, it's going forward or backwards. These sequences are not just part of the system. They're actually representing where the rat wants to go. Cool. This is a learning task. Right? The whole point of the task was the rat was developing automation. The theories say that these are two, we now call them decision systems. At the time, we call them navigation strategies. What happens as the animal automates its behavior? It turned out that the sequences would appear when the rat was in a kind of deliberative mode. As the rat would get used to what it was doing, you'd see the sequences run only in one direction as the rat kind of knew what the right answer was. And then it would go away as the animal automated. When the animal automated, these sequences kind of vanished. And one of the big questions was, what's the relationship of these sequences to the theta cycle? So the hip, to the hippocampal local field potential. So the hippocampal local field potential has two states, uh, a theta state, which is a seven Hertz punctuated by a seven Hertz rhythm that uh, is very clear within the local field potential or this, kind of more broad spectrum thing punctuated by these sharp wave events, which kind of 200 Hertz ripple things that happen. And it turned out, first of all, this was definitely happening during theta, that was very clear. And then we also could ask, you know, if we measured the start and the end of the sequence, what would happen? Now, this is really noisy, right? This is not perfect data by any stretch of the imagination, but they're distributions, right? You do statistics, you ask, What's the distribution of the start in the end? What's the typical average length? Well, it was around one theta cycle. What's the typical starting point? Happened to start at a certain phase of theta. What's the typical ending? It typically ended at a certain phase of theta. Maybe this is actually happening through individual theta cycles. So we peeled the data apart. We found the, the answers hidden within the data. We wrote up the paper, published it in the Journal of Neuroscience. I'm very proud of that paper. It's very well cited and uh, has been, as I said, replicated many times. And in the end, I did get the grant. It's still funded, but it came almost a year after tenure. I was very, very lucky 
my department chair really fought for me. Um, in fact, my department in general was very supportive and I'm greatly appreciative of it. Um, of course, I wasn't in the confidential meeting, right? it's a confidential meeting, but I wasn't in the confidential meeting where they decided my fate, uh, but I heard rumors. And one of the rumors is that there was a magic line set, which said, do we really want NIH making our tenure decisions for us? So for all the junior faculty out there, all the senior faculty trying to get your junior faculty who are struggling at this moment, right, through that, maybe that line will work for you too. I hope it, I hope it does. Nevertheless, they did give me tenure in 2006, and I've had a pretty successful career since. Things have been, those grants have been funded. In fact, we are still looking at the consequences of that serendipitous discovery that Adam made. We are, that has opened up whole dimensions I never imagined possible in terms of decision-making and, and processes. And, and there's just been wonderful science to go play with and chase. But that's not really the lesson I wanna come back from here. Because the really cool part is that I started thinking about science and data differently. The really cool part is that I, I and I think the lab learned a new skill. We learned how to peel data apart. We learned that sometimes you have to go swimming in the data to find what's really there that we almost never design experiments for the discoveries you make. I say almost because occasionally we do, but in general, the real breakthroughs come in places we never expected, in places we never imagined possible. And that means that you have to go in and find the controls that were already hidden within the data. And sometimes you can. And that's pretty cool. Thank you.